it's just fascinating to me to see uh, inflation uh, rear its head for the first time in decades. To, and the Fed is, you know, as I mentioned, so far behind the curve, they've possibly never been further behind the curve than they are today. And the best inflation protection in the, in the stock market is on sale. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. If you Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with macro analyst Jesse Felder. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Jesse, in which he explains why the Federal Reserve may be intentionally trying to engineer a market correction shortly, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment perspective that Jesse and I, as well as our partners at New Harbor Financial share in this video. And please take just a moment to support this channel by first liking this video and then clicking the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Doing so is easy and it helps this channel reach a lot more viewers. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Jesse Felder. Given the environment that you see ahead, what asset classes, sectors, you know, specific instruments do you think will be will fare better um will be more appropriate places to park capital than say the general market of the tech stocks like we've just been talking about yeah well you know i i, I sound uh, you know probably very bearish compared to you know what people see on financial television or, or whatnot but uh, i think it would probably surprise people to learn that i'm very heavily invested in in equities just not in those big you know, popular tech stocks, because I do think that's where the risk is. Um, but I've, you know, one of my models has always been don't let macro concerns get in the way of taking advantage of micro opportunities. And I'm seeing, I've been seeing so many good micro opportunities in the markets, um, you know, in the last 12 months. To me, it's very reminiscent of, the, you know, 20 years ago in 2000, at the peak of the, the, the dot com mania, when you had. Uh, a segment of the stock market that was very expensive and very uh, vulnerable. And at the same time, another segment of the stock market that was uh, incredibly cheap and offered terrific opportunity. And, you know, the, you know, probably the easiest way to kind of recognize those things was, you know, what was most popular? Those were the dot-com stocks, people quitting their jobs to day trade those things. And what was out of favor were the quote unquote old economy stocks um, you know, at the time, which were you'd have retailers trading five times earnings, um, and you'd had uh, you know some some very simple you know bank stocks, thrifts trading you know five times earnings were incredibly cheap, and if you had the kind of wherewithal to take advantage of those things in the spring of two thousand, uh, you made some really good money. As the Nasdaq was imploding, there was a rotation back into these other areas of the market that created a, a terrific opportunity for investors who were positioned for that. So I, I do think there, you know, for me, one of the ways I go about identifying those opportunities is looking at insider activity. And energy is one of the only sectors where I've seen consistent insider buying, uh, you know, for you know, the past almost two years. Um, you know, two stocks I've, I've talked about publicly. Uh, one is Continental Resources, Harold Hamm, one of the most successful, you know, energy entrepreneurs uh, in our country's history. Back in the fall of 2020, he, you know, Continental Resources was, you know, single digit stock, I think, and he was uh, low teens. And he said, I, you know, I'm going to come in the open market and I'm going to be purchasing stock so long as this cheap, this stock remains as cheap as it is. And he bought $100 million or something worth of shares with his own money. And uh, over the last, you know, in the, I think in the fourth quarter of last year, he bought another $30 million of, of Continental tells me that here you go have one of the smartest guys in the business and he's putting his money where his mouth is. He doesn't have to go out and say, you know, this stock's going to the moon and all this stuff. He just quietly can continue acquiring shares. And that to me is a very powerful signal that he still thinks there's plenty of upside and energy in, in, in those energy stocks in particular. Uh, another one is I mean, in the energy infrastructure stocks. I think there's terrific opportunity too. Um, energy transfer ET Kelsey Warren is it you know uh, came in and bought uh, I think in one day he bought over a hundred million dollars worth of stock there um, you know that that's a company that you know terminaling and pipelines for for energy this is a factor of this trend towards ESG so so many people 
said, okay, I want to do good with my money. And this is noble, you know, intentions, put my money into ESG, they de disinvest uh, from uh, old school energy uh, companies. And that created a structural uh, opportunity uh, in these companies where the stock prices were depressed um, for just structural reasons, not based on their business. Uh, but there's been so much underinvestment in energy now for five, six, seven years that the supply and demand equation is just getting so far out of whack. It probably means energy prices are going to stay elevated for a long period of time and that these stocks at five times EBITDA are, are still way too cheap. Uh, you know, it's funny to me, you have people saying, well, where do you, where do you get income, you know, from anything? Well, you look at energy infrastructure, you're going to get five, six, seven, eight percent income almost anywhere you look. Um, and the only reason people don't invest is, well, I don't want to, I don't want to invest in that stuff. And, and uh, well, that's where the opportunity is. And that's why there's opportunity. So I, I think when you look at, at uh, you know, where there are, there's opportunity, you find things like energy, like in gold mining in these stocks. And, and the insiders are, are leading, you know, leading you right down that path saying, you know, where are we selling? They're selling massive big tech stocks and they're buying heavily in, in these other out of favor areas. All right, excellent, thank you. And that is exactly the kind of detail that the folks that watch this program love to see. So thank you for providing that. Um, you did mention gold mining and you'd mentioned gold it itself earlier. Um, I'd be remiss just not to ask you for any additional clarity there on, on you know where your attention is most focused right now. I've, I've had folks on who have talked about kind of the um, kind of perfect storm of positive uh, developments that have been happening in the gold mining sector. So we don't have to spend a ton of time in there. Um, and for folks that haven't watched it yet, if you're curious to hear about that, uh, watch um, this video. I'll put a link up to it here that I did with Tavi Costa of Crescent Capital, where we really dialed through an awful lot of charts uh, on this. But but Jesse, what's got your attention there most? Well, you know, Tavi is an, is an expert in the, in the mining stocks uh, themselves and diving into the business models and whatnot. To me, I, I think of it more of a long a big picture, uh, you know, mindset. And, and one of the things that I, I think about is that, you know, it, it's just fascinating to me to see uh, inflation uh, rear its head for the first time in decades. To, and the Fed is, you know, as I mentioned, so far behind the curve, they've possibly never been further behind the curve than they are today. And the best inflation protection in the, in the stock market is on sale. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. If you if if you're an investor and think, okay, what are the best ways in the stock market to protect myself from inf inflation? It's probably energy stocks and gold mining stocks, and these are the two cheapest segments in the stock market uh, that I can find. And and really, what I think that comes from is people are conditioned to think about uh, these stocks in particular and cyclical shares as uh, things you want to you want to buy when they're expensive and sell when they're cheap, right? Because that's how the cycle works. When e earnings boom and makes the stock looks cheap, uh, that's not a time you want to buy them because, you know, earnings are going to cycle back down. And when earnings cycle down, the stocks get really expensive and that's the time you want to buy them. But what I think people don't appreciate is this is not a normal cycle where we're going to see earnings boom for oil companies and for uh, gold mining companies today, and then they're going to bust. I don't think the earnings are going to bust. And when people realize that they're not going to bust, that we're in the early stages of a longer term bull market, the valuations of all these things are going to be completely repriced. And they're going to have to say, okay, we can't price this as like, you know, Caterpillar stock at the top. We have to price this as, okay, this is a new, this is a new uh, cyclical, or I'm sorry, secular, secular uptrend for earnings in, in gold and, and commodities companies uh, generally. And when people come around to that mindset, the valuations are going to you know, double and triple in a short period of time. So I think it's just a matter of time before people come around to that idea when they do. Uh, by the time they do, prices of these stocks are going to be much higher. Yeah, and what's great about that too, if you're one of those early investors, is not only do you get the appreciation, but you're you're getting paid all along the way, which is something that a lot of these big tech companies have not been doing for the most part, right? Absolutely. I mean, the reason why they're buying back so much stock is because they're diluting constantly, you know, through stock options and all these things. And so, anyone talks about the massive stock buybacks and things, and that's how they return capital. But those are just stock buybacks to to to, to uh, soak up. 
all of the, the shares that they're issuing to employees in, in the form of stock options. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, to me, when I look at, you know, things, uh, you know, in these sectors trading at five times earnings, I'm going, this is just mind boggling. And it's, and it's not going to last very long, I don't think. All right, great. Well, Jesse, this has been fantastic. As we begin to wrap up here, um, I'll just ask the general question. Um, you know, most, most, I would say the vast preponderance of people watching this video are people who are just regular investors who are, you know, concerned about a lot of the factors that we've talked about here. And they just want to be good stewards of their wealth, right? They just want to protect what they have and maybe position prudently to, to, to grow and, 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 prosper by making smart investment decisions through the uncertain and potentially sort of turbulent times ahead. Um, above and beyond what we've already talked about here, do you have any sort of just sort of general advice for that type of person? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake investors are making today is, the, you know, thinking they're diversified by buying the S&P 500. Um, you know, when you look at just asset allocation models, traditional asset allocation models, you know, you, U.S. equities should be the minority of your, your portfolio. And I'm, I'm thinking when you look at the great asset allocators of you know, through time, you know, they maybe have 15, 20, 25 percent in U.S. equities. You have some foreign equities, you own some you know, bonds, you own some real assets. And I think that real assets uh, you know, should probably in any environment be about a third of your portfolio at least. And I don't think anybody really has any exposure to real assets today. I'm talking about, you know, real estate, commodities, precious metals and, and tips. Um, and, and so I think thinking about diversification along a different line, you know, along across asset classes, not just I'm diversified within the stock market is a concept that, you know, I, I probably couldn't push hard enough to investors today that, you know, make sure you own a variety of different asset classes because the asset classes that have performed best over the last 10 years, 40 years, might not be the best performers over the next five and 10. And, and you really want to uh, protect yourself through a diversification across asset classes, not just within the one that you think is the best, you know, has, has, uh, has been the ideal one to own for the last 10, 20, 30 years. All right, great point. And uh, I uh, interviewed Jim Rickards on a panel not that long ago, and he basically drove home that very same point. So you're you're in quite good company there. Um, one clarifying clarifying question on that, which is, um, you know, real assets are they're more complicated to own if you own title to the actual real asset itself, like having to go out and buy land or buy a building or buy into an oil well or or whatnot. Um, when you were differentiating the stock market versus real assets, what would you consider a share of stock in a, in a mining company or in an agricultural producer? Um, are you thinking of that as still more of a stock investment or are you thinking of that as a claim on a real asset? Yeah, I, 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 it's obviously a little bit of both. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I'm um, buying mining shares, gold miners, I look at that as a stock market investment. Um, that for my real assets, I want to own precious metals directly through. And, and when I say directly, I, I really like the Sprott products. I have you know, no affiliation again, but I think that you know, the, the, the physical you know, uh, products that they have are, are good ones. And they allow you to own um, the precious metals uh, directly. Uh, and, and that's just because, you know, gold mining stocks are probably going to be the best way to play gold in a, in a bull market, but they also are basically just a higher, you know, beta version of uh, owning the metals. And I think for me, when I own real assets, I want to own um, the actual assets, not necessarily uh, the, the in an asset allocation model. Um, now, for me as, a, as an investor, as a trader, I'm, I'm, I'm using the mining stocks and I'm using oil producers. I'm not trying to buy barrels of oil. Uh, owning commodities are very difficult. I'd rather own commodity producers. Uh, but from an asset allocation model, I think it does make more sense to have exposure to, to uh, uh, the actual precious metals themselves and, and things like that, because uh, you know, it, it, it just you know, removes that stock market component from, from the model. Yeah, it reduces your counterparty risk and all that. Okay, great. All right, well, Jesse, this has been fantastic. For folks that have really enjoyed uh, hearing you, maybe for the first time, um, where can folks go to learn more about you and your work? Well, I started publishing a blog. Um, it's now at thefelderreport.com. I started publishing that in 2005. 
<laughs> as a, in, in reaction to the, the real estate bubble. And I've been essentially sharing my thoughts on markets and stuff um, ever since um, at thefelderreport.com. I'm also I, you know, pretty active on, on Twitter. I do a lot of reading and, and I, I share a lot of the, the best stuff that I read on Twitter. It's just at Jesse Felder. Great. Well, I've been a longtime reader of your blog and a power follower of you on Twitter and uh, highly recommend that interested folks um, both follow both. Um, when I edit this, Jesse, we'll put up the links to your Twitter handle and your website there. Um, all right, Jesse, well, look, can't wait to have you back on the program again in a couple of months to see what's transpired. We're not going to have very long to wait to see how serious the Fed is here because they basically said they want to start tightening as soon as March. Uh, there's really not that much time between now and then. So we're going to find out pretty soon how serious they are about tightening things up here. Um, and maybe once they do and we see the implications of that, we'd love to have you come back on the channel. But thanks so much, Jesse. It's just been a pleasure. Always enjoy talking markets with you, Adam. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, now's the time on the program where we bring in the lead partners of New Harbor Financial, the endorsed financial advisor, one of the endorsed financial advisors of Wealthion, uh, to get their reaction to what... Uh, Jesse just said, and also talk about uh, what the markets are up to. John and Mike, great to see you guys again. Nice to see you, Adam. Good to see you, Adam. Great. Well, let's just jump right in here, guys. Um, really, really enjoyed this conversation with Jesse, particularly uh, loved both parts, but particularly the, the back half when he got really into some of the specifics about where he sees real opportunity here for today's investors. I'm curious what you guys had to say. Uh, John, let's start with you. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I always enjoy Jesse. Mike and I have been uh, readers and followers of Jesse's work and podcast and Twitter account for some time. We, we like him a lot. He's, he's uh, really about as even keeled as they come in our industry. He's, he's um, you know, uh, broad based in, in his, his research and, and his perspective. And uh, you know, we like that about him. That's kind of how we try to approach things as well. And um, he just lets the data and, and kind of the, the market. Um, Cycles speak for themselves. He doesn't need to in inject all kinds of uh, flowery uh, language around that. You know, he talked about some big picture themes, obviously, um, the extreme market valuations that we've been pounding the table about for longer than we care to, to admit. Um, he talked about the uh, market, um, you know, divergences underneath the surface of the market. Um, you know, particularly talked about cyclical stocks, you know, starting to show some perhaps leading indicators of a weakening uh, economy or a slowing down economy anyways, uh, combined with the, the very likely almost near certain, uh, you know, kind of need for the, the Fed to follow through on its, um, you know, uh, uh, basically their, their, their communications that they're going to have to start to raise rates and, and uh, start to remove some of the, you know, incredibly easy, maybe recklessly easy monetary policy that's been uh, unleashed on the world over the last decade. So yeah, he, he in a word, um, is very concerned about the markets as we are. Uh, he, he thinks a 20 to 30% decline is, is almost, uh, you know, um, uh, I gotta have, you know, uh, not, not just a possibility, but almost a necessary outcome of the Fed needing to do what it needs to do to kind of uh, nip inflation in the bud. And, you know, he, he talked about, uh, again, some of the uh, divergences uh, underneath the market, you know, some of the you know, value starting to outperform growth and, and some of the things that we're, we're starting to observe and, frankly, are, are seedlings for opportunities that we're starting to see to, to play, you know, some opportunities in a very measured way, uh, possibly about some of those divergences as, as they emerge. Good. Well, maybe we can dig into that in a little bit in terms of what specifically you guys are looking at. Um, one of the things that Jesse said that was new, or at least something I haven't heard another uh, expert say on this program, at least not you know, in recent memory, is that he seemed to think that the Fed is engineering a correction at this point in time. Um, and again, was very careful to make the distinction between correction and crash, right? They, he, he basically says they want to take, you know, froth and, and, and you know, give themselves maybe some more um, a wiggle room to, to run with policy at some point in the future. So in his mind, they're actually trying to bring asset prices down now. And of course, the risk there is that they, you know, succeed more than they expect to, and that this thing begins to build momentum to the downside. And that there's a point at which the Fed doesn't want it uh, to, to drop beneath. The question is, is can the Fed, 
you know, fine tune the outcome they want here, or are they playing with a pretty blunt in instrument and really just kind of crossing their fingers that it, it ends up going where they want it to go? Um, I think we all kind of think it's a little bit more of the latter, but 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 we'll see. Um, so, um, Mike, um, another thing, want to get your reaction as well to Jesse, but another thing he said I'd love for you to react to is he said that, um, uh, you know, that with all the all the inflation that's been created and that's raging right now, and we're talking on a day where the December CPI numbers were just released and they've come in at 7%. So that's the highest annual inflation that we've seen in the US in 40 years. I think June 1982 was the last time that inflation was this hot. Um, but Jesse said that the best inflation protection in the stock market is on sale right now. Uh, and he talked specifically about uh, energy and precious metals. Um, so in your reaction, we'd love to hear your, your commentary to that statement. Absolutely, Adam. Um, yeah, like John said, we're big fans of Jesse's work. We think that he's a, a straight talking, honest uh, analyst. And, um, and, and, you know, we see a lot of the things very similarly to, to, to what he does. Um, just so, to put some more color on, on, you know, what John had mentioned about Jesse's, uh, Jesse mentioned that the NASDAQ or the stock market in general has been having some very important deteriorating signals. For instance, he said that 40% of the NASDAQ stocks are down 50% from their yeah, highs. Almost half the market's down 50% from, from its highs. And we've got a market that's never been more disconnected from the economy than it is right now. He also said that, you know, with, with GDP, the economy, gross domestic product, around $20 trillion in the U.S., the, the value of the stock market is close to $50 trillion, you know, almost two and a half times or two, 220%, I think, roughly, is what the latest numbers are of the Buffett indicator, stock market cap to GDP. So almost a $30 trillion difference. All of that is basically air when you realize that long-term stock market cap divided by GDP doesn't generally go over 100%, or if it does go over 100%, better way of putting it, it's what Warren Buffett would previously describe as a, bub a bubble. So, you know, that's close to $30 trillion in stock market value that would be wiped away just to get to 100%. Obviously, that's, that's a disaster. So what we money managers and most other analysts spend all of our time talking about is the Fed. You know, and rightfully so, they've controlled everything for 13 long years, you know, post housing crisis. Everything has been controlled uh, by the Fed. Uh, they've been, they've been uh, directly targeting asset prices because they have to, I think, to continue to float this huge debt bubble that we have. So, you know, you asked about them maybe engineering a stock market drop. Yes, Jesse said they're waving a pin at the biggest bubble in US history, you know? And um, I think it's a dangerous game. I think it's a very dangerous game. We're all so afraid of saying that we think a crash will come or we're afraid of saying that it might be 20% or 30% or 50%. And John and I are the exact same. We're, we're afraid of saying exactly what will happen because we don't know. We've learned so much humility really over these last few years. We only know that we're at the single most extreme set of conditions from a math perspective that really we've ever seen in this country by far. And just a couple words about, uh, about that last bit you asked about, the places to hide, energy and precious metals. You know, to us, these are unloved sectors, both of them. Energy is a little bit more loved than it was a couple of years ago, but still it's only a, in the low single digit percent of, of the S&P, um, relatively undervalued compared to the total S&P. And these companies, uh, pay dividends still. And we like the energy sector. We still think it's a value sector. We've been in and out of it. We're presently out of the energy sector. We're focused more on metals and mining at the moment, but still like the energy sector. And we've long been proponents of precious metals in the mining sector. We've got a core position in miners. We think it's one of the better opportunities in the next, in the next year, maybe two years. All right. And uh, we've talked a lot about that, the reasons why on this program uh, in recent times past. So I won't I won't dive into it too much here. But um, I, I, I do think it's important to underscore that, you know, when 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 asked, Jesse said, hey, you know, you listen to all my macro commentary and I sound like a big bear. But uh, I, I actually am, am 
pretty optimistic about you know some of the investment opportunities out there and was you know really shining a bright light on how both relatively undervalued to stocks or the general stock market, you know, those sectors are, but also just their general trading multiples, you know, their multiples of cash flows and stuff like that are still very low from almost any era standpoint. So again, it's not saying that there's zero value out there in this market. Um, there are still some pockets to be found. Um, all right. And uh, John, as we head back to you, I just want to um, get your thoughts on, uh, the charts of Jesse's that I put up when talking to him about leverage in the market. You know, when we talk about the Fed maybe trying to engineer, you know, a correction with some precision here, I think one of the things that's going to make that really hard for the Fed is that there is so much uh, leverage, you know, speculative leverage in the system now. And if you remember those charts I put up, it's the highest it's ever been. Um, and so as that needs to get unwound during a correction, I mean, you can just have a tremendous amount of forced selling, right? As people are getting hit with margin calls and whatnot. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have defaults begin to ripple across the system. Um, what do you think about the systemic risk that uh, both that, you know, that, that those leverage ratios reveal, plus the corroborating data of uh, the record insider selling, right? Where it's basically, you know, as I, as I asked Jesse, I said, hey, is this a sign that basically the pilots that are piloting the plane that, that uh, investors are on today are actually jumping out the window with their parachutes on? Yeah. Well, Adam, I guess the only way that, you know, Mike and I can, can really digest that question is to, to really just compare it to prior periods. Um, you know, and you go down the list. We've never been nearly this overvalued in all of history. You know, we're we're well beyond the tech bubble value, uh, valuations. For example, two thousand. We've never had this much debt and leverage in the system. Uh, we've never had, as broadly speaking, so many asset classes not only highly correlated, but but also at their own extreme valuations. You know, bonds, for example. You know, look at where bond yields are right now. There's not much room for them to be the safe haven, or at least a, a, a counterpoint and positive return to a potentially declining stock market. So, you know, maybe we're simplistic here, but if you look at the consequences of the prior episodes that even re remotely approached the kind of extremities that we're in right now, they were disastrous. Um, you know, two already 50% plus declines this century, the tech bubble at the turn of the century and the housing bubble. And here we are roughly about the same frequency and we're at the peak of what we think is another huge and actually largest bubble. So if you simply ask, you know, if it was that bad the last times around, how can it be any better this time around? It, you know, all the things that are were concerning then are even more concerning now. And there's more, there's there's fewer countervailing uh, you know, safe points in, in the markets now. You know, back in in 2000, for example, there was, you know, much, much better opportunities, relative opportunities in things like small caps, small caps relative to large caps and whatnot. Um, yeah, so um, we, we think that, you know, there's tremendous risk here and, and, and it's, it's, it's been engineered in the same way that um, Jesse alluded to the, the engineering of a, of, a, of a collapse or a decline. This make no, makes the, make, make, make no mistakes about it. this. This extremity has been engineered by the Fed and central banks, and they've backed themselves into a corner. And now things have gotten, um, you know, very uncomfortable for them because the inflation. And I, I hearken back to a movie that you know came out around the um, documentary that came out around the housing bust called the uh, uh, Money for Nothing. It was a, a kind of a documentary about the Fed, and there was a, a quote in there. I forget who it was. Either um, Alan Greenspan or, or Ben Bernanke, one of the, the Fed chair chairpersons. And the, the quote was, the boom is worth the bust. Um, so, so their whole psyche is, is about engineering a boom and taking as a necessary consequence the bust that has to happen after that. It's a really kind of perverted way of thinking, but that's the kind of underlying philosophy that has led to these policies and, and their eventual removal or, 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 or uh, rescinding from, 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 from where they're at right now. Yeah, it's a good term to use, a perverted way of thinking and, and highly, deeply unfair because the benefits of the boom accrue really to a relatively small amount of people. 
Um, but the pain of the bust is widespread and largely by people who didn't participate very much in the boom. So uh, it, it's, it's really highly unequal. Uh, and therefore, I think, you know, highly, highly unfair. And, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about this in the past, but, you know, hopefully at some point the populace wakes up and realizes that the Fed really isn't the hero in the story that they paint themselves as. Um, and then, you know, maybe if enough people realize that we can demand enough accountability from the officials we elect in the future to maybe affect some real change. But until that happens, I, I fear the beatings are going to continue. Um, all right, Mike, well, like heading back to you. Um, I'd like to wrap up here just uh, talking about gold again for a moment, because last week we were talking about um, how gold was showing some signs like it might finally break out among, among, uh, above its long term resistance level. Um, and we were seeing some nice signs when we talked last week. And then right after we finished recording, <laughs> gold got monkey hammered back down below 1800 again. Um, it has now picked itself back up off the mat. It's now back up at the time we're talking here to about 1827, right back up to that sort of breakout zone um, threshold. Um, and it got some um, wind at its back today because the December uh, CPI numbers came out and people are realizing that inflation is still very real and it's not declining yet. Uh, may still have further to climb. Um, and maybe people are beginning to say, okay, I got to take it seriously. And gold is inflation hedge. And let's maybe start moving some money into there. What are you guys thinking right now about gold's prospects here? Yeah, a lot of it's the same as what we've been saying that gold's in this large sideways consolidation, this triangle. And I'm afraid to say much about gold because last week when I said that gold looked good, it did drop $40 the next, yeah, you the next two it. days. I, I guess know, we can I don't blame wanna... you. I don't want to jinx it, but I got to tell you, there's been a lot of head fakes in gold to the downside and to be fair to the upside as well. But if you stand back, take a look at the big picture, look at a weekly or even a monthly chart, you'll see that we're in a second higher level consolidation that's triangular in shape. It's basically a bullish triangle because the preceding move was was a, a you know an uptrend. And it's just really been struggling there since August of 20. So we're going on a year and a half. Been a couple moves to the downside that have been head fakes. Again, last week after we talked about it, it went down into the 1700s. Right now, we're at, we're up solidly in the 1800s again. I'm looking at it right here. It's 1826 on the Fed futures, up another eight eight dollars today. Gold miners have had a really nice bounce, up to almost uh, you know if you if you take GDX as one example of something that's easy to track. If you're looking at uh, gold miners, that's an ETF, probably the, the biggest ETF that owns gold miners. That's up at 32 after dropping to 29 or so last week. So it, it's really showing some resilience. There's some strong support there. And I really think that gold is going to take off one of these times. Maybe this is the one and surprise everybody. There's no, there's, there's no secret that inflation is a major concern. Almost everyone sees it now in their daily life, even the Fed is somewhat concerned about it, we think. And at the same time, they're, you know, they're, they're waving a pin at this bubble, as, as Jesse put it, which I think is a great way to put it. And it's, it's almost like the market knows that there's going to be a, a pivot, just like happened in 2018, that you know, there's going to be some kind of stock market pullback. The Fed is really going to have to go all in as if they haven't already. They, they may double or triple their effort. And the stock market is forward looking and they know they're going to print a lot of money they they they, they the market knows there's probably no other way out of this when that becomes really clear i think gold takes off to the upside and technical projections would have it running to 2500 or so based on that triangle in, in fairly short form so yeah it's hold hold positions and and you know if you don't own gold or silver it's a good a good time to add it uh, into your into your mix maybe five or 10% up to 20% of your holdings. So we're still very constructive on it. All right, great. And you know, just looking at a chart of gold there, it is crazy uh, to compare year over year where um, last year at this time, gold was trading at a higher price than it is right now. And yet inflation back then was 1.4%. And now mm -hmm. it's hit 7%. Um, so they're very well maybe a reckoning moment there where it gets repriced like you're saying mike 
gosh, if gold went to 2,500, the miners would just go bananas. Um, but anyways, thanks so much for that update there. Gents, thanks for, for joining me this week. As we wrap up, I just want to remind folks that uh, uh, we have the upcoming Wealthion online conference, which is really going to focus on, okay, given everything that we talked about with Jesse, this type of macro environment, these risks, the concerns about a, a coming uh, potential co you know, substantial correction in the markets, um, and potentially one that triggers a recession, um, how to deal with high inflation. You know, as investors, how do we navigate this type of landscape? Um, we've got a phenomenal number of speakers coming. We've got folks like Lacey Hunt, uh, Jim Grant, um, Jim Rickards, Danielle DiMartino Booth, Luke Groman, um, Brent Johnson, Rick Rule, Tavi Costa of Crescott Capital, Jeff Clark, uh, Ivy Zellman talking about uh, uh, the real estate market. We just landed um, Stephen McBride, who's going to talk to us about uh, crypto and the blockchain. Uh, it's a phenomenal lineup of speakers. If you're watching this on uh, Friday, January, uh, let's see, 14th, um, you've got until midnight to lock in the early bird price for registration. So to learn more about the conference, as well as to register, just go to Wealthion.com slash Jan 2022. Um, and uh, if you don't get the early bird price, don't worry, you can still get a seat for the conference. Uh, conference itself is on January 22nd. All right, folks. And if you're trying to figure out, OK, what do I do uh, in order to safely uh, navigate and safeguard my wealth? Uh, through all of these turbulent uh, trends and, and uh, challenges that we're talking about here, um, John and Mike and their team at New Harbor Financial, uh, as well as Wealthion's other endorsed financial advisors, offer free consultations. There's no requirement to work with these guys at all. You just sit down with them for 30 minutes, tell them about your personal financial situation. They tell you what they think you should do. Um, if you're interested in setting one of those up, just stick around at the end of this video. Uh, we tell you how to do that. Otherwise, Mike and John, whatever happens next, we'll be tracking it here together. Thanks for joining me for yet another week. And everybody else, thanks for watching. Thank you so much, Adam. Can't wait till next time. We'll see you in a week, Adam. Thanks again. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth and because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry, the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now, we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA. But for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.